At the moment, we've concentrated on the visuals of this, the basic structure, the HTML. The login and the sign up does not really work, even though it may sort of seem like it's starting to work. That's where the JavaScript comes in, and this is where we'll get more complex. So uh, when we played with JavaScript on day one, we started to write some JavaScript at the end of our document. That's not the most efficient way. We should have the HTML code in its own file, the JavaScript code in its own file, and the CSS code in its own file. That's called the separation of concerns. And basically, it means your HTML, uh, the concern of it, is it's in its own file. So all of this file is just HTML. So therefore, we will focus on HTML in this document. Uh, when we want to focus on the style of things, when we want to change these fonts and these colors and sizes and all of that stuff, that's going to be CSS, and we're going to write CSS in its own file. We're going to do first some JavaScript, so JavaScript should be in its own file. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, in Notepad right here, go ahead and save if you haven't saved your file yet. We'll go up to File, New. Let's create a brand new, new file. File menu, New. File menu, save as. I'm going to save my project. I mean, I'm going to save this file in my project folder, cbdb0621. I'm going to save it in this same folder where my index file is at. So obviously, we need to keep all of our files together. And I already see that we've got the jQuery JavaScript, and I've got the jQuery mobile CSS. So I'm going to save a file in this same folder as our project, I'll call it my javascript.js and also your save as type javascript. So I just confirm whatever the name of the javascript file, it can be called kittycat if you want, kittycat.js, sure. I'm going to call this my javascript.js save as type javascript. Okay, so this is now a JavaScript file. Uh, therefore, the code that we write here will all be JavaScript, different syntax than what we've been writing before, and also uh, different comment syntax. Uh, so I'm going to do double slash here to write our very first comment to say our custom JavaScript code goes here. And I'll say another comment. Uh, we use an immediately invoked function expression. I'll fully explain that in a moment. We're going to do this. Open parentheses, close parentheses, open parentheses, close parentheses, semicolon. So the parentheses are shift 9 and shift 0. Gonna, uh, I'm going to have a couple of lines of JavaScript here in the beginning that I'm going to gloss over for a little bit. They're a little too complex that I want to talk about for the moment. So we'll just write them rote for the moment. Uh, then we'll write function, open, close parentheses again. Notice here, OK, well, I've got these open and close parentheses that are encompassing this thing called function. And then another pair over here and semicolon. Yes, so you're going to have you know, two of them here and such. Then I'm going to write an open and close curly brace. The curly brace is next to the P. Next to the P, you've got square brace or square bracket. You need shift square bracket. Those are the curly braces. They're right next to the letter P on the right. 
This is an immediately invoked function expression. It's a little complex, more complex than I want to talk about at the moment. But I'm just going to say we need this command in our JavaScript to run it the most efficiently, to write to run it more better. Just follow me at the moment. This is what we need here. Uh, I'm going to go in between those curly braces and press Enter two times to break it apart. So again, following this, if you just look at it all by itself, this looks like total gibberish. But you see it's coming back from here. And if you put your mouse cursor here, for example, this should highlight its pair. It found the pair of this anonymous function. If I put my mouse on this um, parenthesis over here, it should find its pair up here. And then these should be right there too. So you should have every instance of every character that I have here. If I look at it here, here's the pair as well. If you're missing any of these things, your code will completely break. Because especially when we get to JavaScript, one wrong character can break your whole program. Not one wrong command or one wrong line, one wrong character. If I forgot to close it, oh, but I see the pair there. No, that pair is supposed to close that pair. And that's a big mistake there. Everything will be broken. So you have to make sure you've got your pairs. Next line here in quotes, open quote, end quote. I'm going to write use strict. And then at the end of the line, semicolon. And I write a comment here. Activate JavaScript strict mode. or better debugging. JavaScript, um, in some instances, is very rigid in what you need to write, and in other instances, perhaps not as rigid. The problem with it when it's not as rigid is that then it might be difficult to figure out what, what your mistake was. Sometimes there are silent errors. There are errors that the web browser detects but doesn't tell you about for some reason. By activating use strict the use strict directive, it's saying, OK, uh, check my code very harshly and tell me when there are errors. This is optional to use, but even this immediately invoked function expression is optional. I'm going to show you from the very beginning early on. This is how I highly recommend to write your code. And oftentimes, you will see these starting commands when you read tutorials, especially of advanced coding. Next line, console.log. At the end of each line here, something new. We have not had to do this in the HTML. We have to end each line basically with a semicolon. The semicolon is end of line statement. Here's a JavaScript command, end of line. We even see it up here. Not here, because remember a moment ago, this was one long line. This and this were one line, end of statement. When I broke it apart into multiple lines, we do not put a semicolon there. It does not end there. It ends there. It continues here, goes through here, then ends the first command, the first statement. Use strict, end of statement. Console log, end of statement. The whole program of JavaScript then ends there. Console log, quotes, ready to rock. Question. Would that use strict only be for that function, or would it work for every other function? It'll work for everything because it's one of the first things we wrote. Okay. Since this goes from top to bottom, left to right, it'll activate strict mode right away, line five, and then everything that follows will adhere to strict mode. Console log. That sounds familiar. Can anyone remember what that was about, day one? Down in the developer's console, we're going to go see that message. OK, great. Go ahead and um, save it and run it. Let's see that message. We will run into two stumbling blocks. Number one is that if you run the code here, it'll say, great, here's your code. So one thing you're going to do is you're going to run your HTML file. 
So you need to remember to switch back to the index file and then run it. The console is in F12, remember. I go to console, huh, I don't see my message. Let me go back and check my spelling. That's not the issue. The issue is that we don't have this JavaScript file connected to that HTML file. They're both independent at the moment. So here's a couple of things you're going to need to remember. If you're running your JavaScript, it'll just show you your raw JavaScript. So you just need to remember to go back to your index and then run it. Or if you've got the file in the browser, you need to refresh the file. The other thing is we need to one time connect this JavaScript file to the index.html file. Uh, I guess one more thing also to remember. We're going to be working with more than one file. And the tabs up here show me I've got my index file open and my, jo my JavaScript file open. One has not been saved. Which one? Why do you say that? It's red. Yep, so that little uh, disk icon there is a little quick reminder that that file has not been saved. You're going to need to remember to save all your files when you test your work not just the index. And here we've got the icon up here, save all, which is also file menu, save all, control shift s. So you're going to remember to save all your files that you've worked on. You're going to remember to go back to the index and run the index or else you'll just get the raw JavaScript. And what we need to do then is connect this JavaScript back to HTML. So let's go back to the HTML. scroll all the way to the end of our code. In my case, I've got 163 lines. On line 159, I've got the connection to the jQuery file. Then I've got the connection to the jQuery mobile file. Next, I need a connection to myjavascript.js. I use the exact same syntax that I've already got there to link it to myjs. Next line, we can write a comment. Our custom a connection to our custom JavaScript file based on what we've written so far based on what we've written so far script tag source and then the name of our JavaScript file in the quotes which we called myjavascript.js. So now that there's the connection between the HTML and the JS, now if I run my code, now if I run my index and go to F12, I should see the console log output message because the browser will take the HTML file, it'll process everything from line 1 to 160, then it'll get to 161, it'll jump over to the JavaScript file, do what's in there, show it on the screen, then come back to the HTML file and close the body, close the HTML. So make sure you've saved everything. You want to run that. F12, ready to rock. So let's pause there. Did you get your console message in the browser after this connection? You want to have a little trouble that it didn't? Now because we might be working with two or more files at once, it might be annoying to jump back and forth between two screens what we can do is this. I want to look at the index file and the JavaScript file at the same time. You can right click the tab and select clone to other view and look at it in two different screens. You can also do right click move to other view, index on one side, JavaScript on the other. Right click move to other view goes back 
clone and move, you see they're slightly different. Maybe for whatever reason I want to see two copies of the same file. Maybe the file is 1,000 lines long. And if I clone it, I can look at lines 100 here and lines 1,000 there. Two different parts of the same file if I clone it in two different views. Yes? Does no plus check the syntaxes of the code? It's showing an error in the console or an error in Notepad? Yes, um, I have to double check if it. Brackets honestly is a little bit better in that way of checking syntax. Mm -hmm. This, uh, on sometimes it's a little simpler than I would like. Uh, but it's also a, a kind of like a faster, more efficient uh, editor. Uh, I think somewhere in the options, I'd have to look it up, but I think there's an option to turn on more of this syntax highlighting. But this fix, uh, you should kind of like be aware of the spaces and yeah. whatever commas, so it's better to this. And if it does show some, some kind of like syntax problem, what, what should it be done? Should it be fixed in the code or just in the code? Yes, uh, brackets and like also like Microsoft Visual Code and other newer editors, they do give you a little bit more feedback about um, proper syntax of code. Um, at the moment, the settings I've got on Notepad, I've kind of got those off just to kind of practice a little bit more writing it more manually. But in the settings in here somewhere, I have to look up exactly where, but in the settings there is more ability to do more of that syntax highlighting and such. Yes. He'll be there one moment.
All right, so um, in the JavaScript, this was just um, this console log. We're going to use console.log a lot throughout the class. This is a very useful little command to give yourself some feedback. If I see the ready to rock message in the console here, it shows that at the very least, my HTML file is connected to the JavaScript file. Then anything else that is complex, I should be able to start to, to work with and, and debug. If I don't see the message ready to rock, then that means there's no connection between the HTML and here. OK, so once we've got that quick little message here, uh, what we need to do is we need to start to um, set ourselves up so that it so that the JavaScript sees these boxes and see what was written inside of them. We need to set up the JavaScript so that when someone clicks join, it then triggers JavaScript for it to process their name, their password, check the database, blah, blah, blah. We need to start to create JavaScript objects representing these HTML nodes, uh, and then create event handlers and such. On the event that this join button is pressed, I want JavaScript to run. When the JavaScript runs, check what was typed into these boxes and then process it. So in the JavaScript, we're first going to create variables that are based on the various JavaScript elements. Uh, JavaScript is very powerful, very complex in that it can look at and manipulate elements in HTML and CSS. It can also create HTML or CSS code. So JavaScript not only can do its own thing, but it can also manipulate, create, destroy, alter HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The first thing that I want to do here is I want the JavaScript to pay attention to this sign up form. So behind the scenes, there is a form here that I want JavaScript to pay attention to. So we're going to do VAR. This is a variable. Space. We'll just type this for a moment, then I'll explain it. Dollar symbol EL form capital F sign up capital S and U equal to dollar symbol parentheses semicolon. The explanation for this is I'm gonna write the I'm gonna write the long JavaScript comment, starting the comment, ending the comment, I'm going to write a long explanation. Instead of just a single line, I'm going to write multiple lines, so starting and closing multiple lines. We're saying here, we must create JavaScript objects representing HTML nodes so that we can listen for a click, process an input field, store data, retrieve data, change something in the HTML, etc. using JavaScript keyword or command var lets us create variables or objects console is an object remember on day one we did document dot write so you don't have to write this, but remember the other time we did document dot write, and we wrote hello world. So don't write this. Remember the other time. Okay, we've got the document object. We're going to use the write method or command. We're going to write the message hello world into the document. Well, what we've done today, we're going to go to the console object, the F12 panel. We're going to use the log command to write the message there. So into that object we used a method. Into that place, we did something. With that thing, we did something. With that object. 
okay, we're gonna we can create our own objects. One way is via variables. A variable is an object, is a container, is a representation of something. Um, you can think about it like this. This container can hold anything, water, apple juice, whatever. So uh, this is an object, this is a container, there's stuff inside of it. That's what I'm doing here. Let's create an object. This is a mug. This object that I've created is called $L form sign up. Equal, what are we putting in the, in the object? In my case, my object has water. So we're going to put something into it. So we're creating an object. It's going to be set equal to something in HTML so that then we can manipulate it in JavaScript. I'll explain it further in just a moment, but to complete the command here, quotes pound form sign up. I'm looking at the HTML on one screen and the JavaScript in another to fully explain here. So I'll write it in the notes in a moment. There is some HTML node, there is some HTML thing called form sign up with an ID. That is going to be represented in JavaScript as this sort of shortcut or keyword. In the HTML, I've got a form with a unique ID. So in order for us to be able to read what's in this, or even manipulate what's in this, I need to represent it in JavaScript. That's what I'm doing here. Go find something in the HTML called form sign up with that ID, so that we can re reference it or refer to it as this JavaScript object. So to add more to our notes here, specifically using jQuery, we search for an HTML node with an ID of form sign up. And set it um, equal to the um, jQuery based variable L form sign up. Or we assign it to that. I think the correct term, assign it to the jQuery variable jQuery based variable L form sign up. This right here dollar symbol parentheses is actually a jQuery command. Um, for your notes, you can write a comment here. The plain old JavaScript equivalent. Co comment var L form sign up equal to document.getElement by ID quotes form sign up. We've got jQuery uh, library active in our project. In the HTML document, Remember the last three lines in the HTML document were saying, let's, um, let's connect to jQuery, then jQuery mobile, then our custom JavaScript. Well, if we didn't have jQuery to do the thing we're trying to do here, we would say, let's create a variable, let's create an object, call it whatever we want, L for element, element form sign up, assign it to Let's go to our HTML document. Let's get 
an element by the ID form signup. And now we can refer to this form as this variable in JavaScript. This was the plain old JavaScript method. The one that we wrote right here is the jQuery version. What's that? Is that part of the framework? It's part of the jQuery framework. Yes, jQuery, not jQuery mobile. The jQuery. This right here, dollar parentheses, is equivalent to document dot get element by id technically get query but document dot get element by id so instead of writing 12 characters 20 characters whatever this is we write one dollar symbol that's the point of something like jquery we saw on the jquery website their slogan was write less do more so instead of writing this huge command that i'm going to misspell because beginners always misspell it because they put capital i capital d that's wrong it's capital I lowercase d. Instead of writing that huge command in plain old JavaScript, you can write the simplified jQuery version. But the only reason that works is because in the HTML, we've got a connection to jQuery. If I was to move that file or delete that uh, script line, then this wouldn't work anymore. This dollar selector here wouldn't work anymore. I'd have to use the, the, the long version. Both of these are basically equivalent, but this is a lot longer to type, isn't it? More to remember, more to type, more to misspell. This is the big reason why we use a framework or a library like jQuery. Oftentimes it is more shorthand. And it's a common practice then when you create variables that were then created via jQuery to also prefix them with a dollar symbol. This one over here was created with plain old JavaScript, so no, no dollar symbol. And I'll say common practice to use the dollar prefix for any objects created via jQuery. Reason. You cannot then use plain JavaScript methods on jQuery based objects and vice versa. Uh, this is not proper code but just as an example L uh, dot form sign up dot HTML hello compared to l form sign up dot inner html equal to hello now these commands I'm, I'm writing the double slash in front of all of them because these are comments this is all deactivated code just for the notes so if up here I'm creating a java a jQuery based variable if I've used the jQuery selector to select the html node I have to then use jQuery commands, methods, to do stuff with it. This is not fully correct, but just an example. Uh, I'm writing the word hello. I'm writing the HTML hello into that form. Doesn't quite make sense, but that's the idea. I'm going to write the word hello via HTML into that form. Well, the plain old JavaScript, the equivalent is the name of the object dot inner HTML equals hello. So see, it's a different syntax. The point of it is, if I create a variable using jQuery, I then need to use jQuery methods to work with it. If I create a variable or an object with plain old JavaScript, I have to use plain old JavaScript methods and properties. I can't jump back and forth between both syntaxes. So that's why very early on I'm talking about jQuery early on, because it is a very common, very popular, robust framework. Uh, if you learn uh, jQuery and you have access to jQuery you, you're able to do the basics and more faster if you only start with J JavaScript plain old JavaScript you're gonna write lots of code to do the same thing that you can do a lot easier <coughs> so here then all of this explanation all, the only <laughs> real command is right here 
let's create an object, let's create a variable representing the form in the HTML document. It's the one with that ID. This will make more sense as we do it, especially if you're a beginner. We're going to say that when a person clicks the submit button on the sign up form, it then starts the whole sign up process. So we need to create an event listener. We need to listen for an event. We need to be on the lookout for something to happen. And the something is going to be clicking submit. So we're going to have our our submit button be active. You should also make a note before we do that. Variables. This is a comment. I've written it very differently from everything else. The only thing that's important is the double slash here. But this, well, these lines here, these dashes are just here for you at a glance as you're browsing your hundreds of lines of code. This hopefully stands out. All of the variables that we're going to create are in this chunk. All of the functions we're going to create will be in another chunk. And all of the event listeners will be in another chunk. little space down here, some lines, event listeners. Basically, pay attention to events to do things. There is a submit button. I press submit, an event happened. Someone press submit, let's do something about it. Someone does a right click. That was an event. Let's do something about it. Mm -hmm. I'm connecting to the database. We successfully connected. That's an event. Do something about that. So there's a lot of sort of like reactions. There's a lot of events. We handle these events. These are event listeners. We're listening for a certain thing to happen. Then we do something else. dollar l form sign up this is now the representation of that form in the html in the javascript here we're calling it l form sign up that basically means everything that is the form in the html so basically everything that's over here all of these inputs and labels and all of that, all of this has been basically compressed into this JavaScript object. So we can pay attention to what did they write in here, what button did they press, and so forth. Yes? So if it is so simple with JavaScript, why use the HTML? Is the HTML an actual app? Is that what really governs all this? Programs? Well, every uh, language has its purpose. The HTML has the purpose, as we've seen all along, to create the structure of things. And then the JavaScript has the purpose to do interactivity. Technically, you could write only in the JavaScript, and it could create the HTML. I think that's way too complex and overkill. That could be done, but every uh, language has its purpose. That's the short answer. So you do the interactivity in JavaScript. You need the HTML for the structure. You need the CSS for the design. L form sign up dot submit. So basically, when anyone presses the submit button, pay attention to when someone clicks the submit button of that form, and we're going to have more than one form: the sign up form, the login form the save a comic form, the delete a comic form. 
So whenever one presses the submit, whatever it's called, ours was called um, save or welcome or join or something, whatever it's called, but it's got the, uh, it's got the command of submit. We want to run a function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace, event fn sign up open close parentheses semicolon there and then event here okay, so this is pay attention to an event and then do something on the event of a submit when someone press, presses the submit button of this form we will run a function. I'll explain functions in a moment. Capturing an event, passing it into this named function. So yes, this you can easily lose track of open and closing and all of that, so be very careful. Make sure you've got it like this. We've got a pair of parentheses that is connected together for submit. We've got a pair of parentheses that is connected to this named function right here. We've got a curly brace pair, which is regarding your anonymous function. We've got another pair of parentheses regarding this uh, parameter. So if you want to say specifically here, whenever someone clicks the submit button of the um, form sign up, call a named function, fn sign up, and pass through. the event, the click event, the submit event. This event that we're capturing is the one that happens when someone presses submit. Oh. It's related to this particular event that we're listening for, the submit event. Yes? Um, so it's, you're looking for the input type of submit. Doesn't matter what the value we call correct? The type of action of submit. We're looking, yes, exactly. If we look at it right here, it's of input type submit exactly the value doesn't matter and it's this particular submit button in this particular form because we've set up here we've set over here there is some form somewhere with this ID so you have to specify each, section, each. each uh each form when we do the uh, uh, log in form we'll do something very similar l form login and then we'll have the l form login dot submit so each one will have its own it knows which node which html piece to look at yes because right now it's like well i've got two forms and they've all both got submit which is the one that matters it's the one with the particular id yes yes anyone else no okay question We haven't gotten to that. We haven't gotten to that yet. But this is a function. Uh, we're going to come back and define this function right now. Uh, so f basically, a function is going to be a series of steps. 
Um, we're about to do that right now, but what we've got so far is once we click submit, we will run a function. We don't we haven't defined this function yet. We're about to do it. Yes. Um, of form, sign up, can you any other thing? Yes and no. This can be sign up dog, but right now it would be it would not work because up here I called it L form sign up. Yes, exactly. Yes, that variable that we're creating could be called anything. It could be called kitty cat. And so I can say here, kitty cat dot submit, and it'll work. As long as you keep the variables consistent, yes, it'll work. The idea, the, the most important thing is then, okay, if this thing is called kitty cat, what is it made from? Where is it coming from? It's coming from this thing called that particular ID, which in the HTML is that particular form. Right, so to complete what's going on here. Oh, yes, question. On line 21, shouldn't that form sign up in the, uh, in the capital Let's confirm. If I go look at my index, I call this form sign up. So if I call this form sign up, then it better be form sign up over here. But I'm just calling it the same way as I called it in the HTML. So um, I was doing that the capital letters are the subsequent words. And so I didn't have the capital letter there, so it's not the capital letter. You might be thinking if we're doing, for example, instantiation of objects, and often that has a capital first letter, but this is slightly different. All right, so to complete this, it's going to be sort of like three big things. One, I create the object that represents the HTML. Two, is there some sort of event that I need to pay attention to? In this case, submit. Three, oftentimes then, well, I'm going to run a function that further does things. Let's define that function. This doesn't exist anywhere in JavaScript. Submit exists, and VAR exists, and other things exist. Function exists here. But FN signup doesn't. We're going to make this up ourselves. We made this up ourselves, L form signup. The dollar uh, selector exists, but we made up L form signup. So we need to define what is this function, fn sign up. fn is for function. It's common practice to have variables first, then functions, then listeners. So we're actually going to back up, and here's where all of our functions are going to be. Function definitions. We'll say function, fn sign up. Open close parentheses, curly brace, enter a couple of times, close curly brace. Parentheses event. So the after submitting the form, we will run a function. We invented the function right here, function sign up event. Quick note, functions are commands grouped together. Very short answer. Because I need several things to happen. Once a person clicks submit, I need the JavaScript to, uh, to capture their email. I need the JavaScript to capture the password and the confirm password and compare those two. I need the JavaScript to confirm that person doesn't exist yet, let's create a new account. Or that account does exist, let's tell them. So like six or seven things have to happen by simply clicking submit. That's a bunch of things have to happen. So we group them all together basically in a function. The function will then process line by line, top to bottom, doing a bunch of things at once. Several things need to happen when I submit. Inside of the parentheses here, we will say console log. Quotes. FN sign up is running.
here's more sort of like helping yourself for for troubleshooting I'm gonna click the submit button nothing happens I get no feedback in the console no error what what's happening here in, in a moment when we write one more line and we test it if we get the feedback every time we click that login button or sign up button and we get this message that's at least telling us yes your whole system here is running you've created the variable this the submit event listener is working and the function is written right if I don't get the message function sign up is running something is wrong and I have to figure it out one more line then we'll test it event dot prevent default default behavior when submitting a form is to refresh therefore prevent that some of you saw that when you tried to do your sign up or your sign in it seemed to take you back to the welcome screen and some of you saw that an error message well the default behavior of trying to submit the form was to refresh the screen assuming it's on a web server we're not going to be on a web server eventually we're going to be in an app we don't want our app to refresh when we click submit that was often the default behavior on a website there's a form I click submit it refreshes the screen to show me something new I don't want that in my app so I'm saying the uh, the event of refreshing it what we're capturing right here when we submit the default action or event is to refresh the screen we're saying no prevent default capital D there very important so now it will not refresh the screen it will not give you that error message in Chrome it should not if you typed it right but it what should do in the console log it should say it should say that it should say that this function is running uh, at this point I believe we are able to save it and run it to see where, where we're at so far Remember, if we try to run the JavaScript, you will not get what you expect. You want to run the HTML, or you want to refresh your browser. Index run Firefox F12 right away. OK, it says ready to rock. That's why I, what I expect. Good. If I go to sign up, if I try to join without doing very much, I'm going to get those errors that I expect. So I'm going to fill in whatever. And then right here, just a.a, .a, password a. Don't even get complex or anything about putting a real email and putting a real password. It's a waste of time. I'm going to click Join. Function sign up is running. It did not refresh. Good, I don't want that. It did not actually log me in. We're way far away from actually really logging in yet. But my output here is saying at least that function is running. It did detect that you created the object. It did detect the submit. It did run my function. In Chrome, just to compare it, same thing. I'm going to F12, ready to rock. I'm going to sign up. I'm going to fill in whatever very quickly. A at a.com, password A, password A, join. Feedback is the function is running. No error message. It doesn't refresh me. It doesn't move me to home. That's normal. It's not there yet. And then my console here it tells me in line 7 of my JavaScript was my ready to rock message and then in line 30 of my JavaScript was my this function is running message raise your hand if that worked okay good take your hand pat yourself on the back you are now a JavaScript programmer Let me help you in one moment. So um, if it worked at this point, we're, we're not there yet, but we have the big ideas that we're going to see over and over, which is we need to create an object for the HTML node. We often then need to create some sort of event listener, submit, load, error, whatever then we need to create some sort of function that does something as a result of the event. We will do this 
several times. So here's our code so far. And then we'll keep going to make it work for real.
So at this point in the um, JavaScript, it's, a, it's very basic in terms of, at the very least, it detects that if I click the Join button, it, it uh, recognized the object I created, the event listener of submit, which then took me to the function, function sign up is running. What I want to do here then is I want to capture everything that's been written into those input fields. I want to capture what did they write as the email, as the password, as the confirm password, so then I can start to process it. So when we created this variable at the top here, these are technically global, these are technically global scope variables. These are variables that we can use throughout our whole project. So we'll make a quick note here saying also um, here we've got global scope variables. They can be used in any function. If we create a variable outside of a function, we can use that variable in a function. The opposite is if we create a variable in a function, it can only be used in that function. If I create a variable called kitty cat inside a function sign up, I can only use the variable kitty cat in that function. I cannot then use kitty cat out here in a separate function. Uh, that'll become more important um, as we go on, but just something to think about. Variables outside of a function are used everywhere. Variables in a function are only in that variable. That's actually what I want right now. I only want this program to pay attention to or to care about their email and password as long as the function of sign up is running. After that, I don't need to store that information anymore. When a function runs, it's in the memory and when it, of the computer, and when it finishes running, it leaves memory. I don't have to be juggling, the computer doesn't have to be juggling all of these variables all the time. It doesn't have to be using up all of this memory. So in the function of sign up, we're going to create some variables. We'll say local scope variables. Only in memory as long as this function runs. and only usable in this function. So sometimes I see people uh, up on the top of their code create variables for everything that they're going to use in their program. And sometimes that's inefficient. You don't need to create variables and use up memory for every single thing until you need it. So in this case, We'll create some variables. Next line, var dollar l in email sign up equal to. This is telling me already. I'm about to use jQuery uh, to go find some HTML node so I can reference it in JavaScript in jQuery dollar selector, this time comma. So this dollar selector, that's jQuery. This is basically go find something with an ID or a class when we get to that. Go find something with a certain ID and store it as JavaScript temporarily in this variable, in this function, as long as it's running. We don't need the program to keep looking over and over and over into that sign up screen only when a person signs up. Quotes pound in email sign up.
in this form, I've got an input field of in email sign up. Right, this input field of type email has a unique identifier ID in email sign up. This is what I'm saying here. When a person, person presses submit, create a new variable. We're going to store what the person wrote in an object, an HTML node, with an ID of in email sign up. In email sign up. Go find it with jQuery. Go find an ID this ID and store it in this variable. We need to do the same thing for the password and the confirm password. So I put a comma this time. It's not end of statement because I want to create one variable and another variable and comma another variable and then semicolon end of statement. I want to create three variables at once so I'm putting the comma at the end. Next line, I'm going to tab this just for readability. $L in password sign up equal to the jQuery selector, comma. Well, good thing I'm very consistent with my syntax. Quotes, pound, in, password, sign up, comma. And the next one. Dollar el in password confirm sign up. So this first one quotes pound in password sign up. Spelling of course matters. If you put a capital I here, you better have put a capital I in the HTML and vice versa. Capital U capital P, you better have written capital U capital P in the HTML comma because we're continuing. Create one variable and create another variable and create one more variable. Dollar L in password confirm sign up equal to jQuery selector then a semicolon. I'm done creating variables. So final semicolon there. Yes. Um, to get those variables line up, did you press enter? Is that allowed to press enter after the comma? Yes, after the comma, I press enter for the next line. Yeah. And then I press tab to, uh, to line them over. Also, just for fun, I'm also going to tab these over. Like that. Pound in password. Confirm, sign up. So these are also tabs or spaces. This is valid. I just did it like this. These line up really nice. This is the name of the JavaScript or jQuery based JavaScript object. Um, we're assigning uh, the, uh, the HTML node. <coughs> We're using the jQuery selector to find an ID, find an object with this ID. This one, this one, and this one. We did it three times, so two commas here. Do it once, and then do it a second time, and then do it a third time. End of statement. Semicolon. Next line. To confirm that the JavaScript is seeing what was typed into those boxes, console. Dot log. Dollar L in not quotes. Email sign up. Enter console log. Dollars L in. Password, wasting my time, copy and paste. And console, copy and paste. Save yourself some time. I want to, um, 
output. Okay, if I if I think that I've captured what these were, I want to show them in my console. I want to show what, what, what the values were typed into those boxes. Technically what this is saying is, let's go find an input box named this and store it in this JavaScript object. And here I'm saying, OK, show me the object. The problem here is the object has many properties. It has what was typed into it. It has what was the font in it. It had what was the size of the font. It had what was the color typed into it. So specifically then, we say .val, open close parentheses, give me the value of what was typed into this box. So this box represents this input field in the HTML. So we need to finish this with each of these dot val method. This is the command. Here's our object, here's our method. Just like we had console.log, console is the method, log is the command. We have document.write. We had the document object, the method of write. So we're saying here the method of val of the of this object write it into the console, F12. So each of these needs it. Save it and run it. Open up your console, F12. Type some stuff into that sign up, into those sign up boxes. Click submit. And hopefully, if you did it all right in the console, you should then get back everything you typed into those boxes. Every time you press submit, you should see. JavaScript should see what you type into those boxes and it outputs it to the console. Give that a try. Save everything, run it, try it. What's that? It says that Okay, I'll help you in a moment. Let me check my code. Let's see here. I'm going to open up it in Firefox first. I'm going to go to sign up. I will type something here. I'll type in some password. I'll click join. My output says, okay, my function sign up is running. Line 31, as I've seen before. Then I see the email that I typed. It said on line 41. I typed my password, AAA. Line 42. I typed my confirmed password. Whoops, I mistyped it, but it doesn't care yet. I haven't programmed that yet. But it saw that I typed AAA, even though it's hidden over there. Line 43. If I change this to something else, if I clear it, if I clear it, um, type Janet at uh, jones.biz password. You can't see it there, but then when I click join, it says the function is running again, because I click submit. It saw the email that I typed, and it saw the password that I typed. Let's change this a little bit more, then we'll, then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, to be obvious, actually what I want to do here in the console is I want to type quotes space plus and say, your email is colon space. And then over here, quotes space plus space. Your password is quote space. quotes plus your confirmed password is and 
So it's typing a message first, in quotes, whatever you want it to say, and then what is the value of the email box? Another console output, it's going to say your password is, in quotes, so it's literally going to say that. This is a string literal. It's going to say this exactly, and then it's going to say what is the value of what was typed into the password sign-up box. And the third one. Guys, question there? Uh, you guys have a question? So we don't put anything in the, the value after EAL. Nothing goes in here because this is reading the value. We can use it to set the value, but right now we're using it to read the value. Question. Okay, uh, on this confirm one? The set the when you figure the original password. Okay, I'll check you in a moment, but here's one way to start to troubleshoot yourself. If you um, if you double click the the variable, for example, it should highlight it here and highlight it there. If it doesn't highlight, that might mean it's misspelled. Now you can also check over here. If this is if this JavaScript is based on this HTML, confirm that this in the quotes is exactly what you typed over here in the HTML. That's one way where it'll say undefined because you might have misspelled something. But I'll be there one moment. So um, at this point, again, it's still not working yet, but it's starting to detect what's in those boxes. And this is as far as we'll go at this point. We want to make sure it does this at least. I'm going to end the main lecture at this point to have a little lab time at the end of the day. I'm going to put my code up to this point into the, lab, into the network folder if you want to compare. Uh, I'm going to upload the videos again, and um, you can check the video. So we'll do a little lab time until 9.30. If it worked, great job. If it didn't, call me over. We'll figure it out. But I'm also going to put my code into the folder.